when I was about seven years old, one day out of the blue, my mom says, today you're going to see your real dad. Growing up, I've always known one man to be my dad, and one day out of the blue, she tells me I'm going to see another dad. And so I go see my biological father for the first time in my life at seven years old, never knew. People had asked me around my town, like, hey, you feel son. I'm like, who else feel? And so one day, this guy, this light-skinned guy, looks like me, but just lighter. He was at a Memorial Day parade in New Jersey by the ice cream truck. My mom introduced and said, hey, this is your father. I remember it, clear as day. He bought me an orange sun-kissed soda. He said some words to me, patted me on the back, and said he would you know, see me later. Later on that evening uh, or, or day, this Memorial Day weekend, uh, we would then go to Plainfield, New Jersey, where my mom was staying with my, my stepfather, who was just home from prison for some armed robberies and burglaries and handgun and other gangster charges. And um, she said, first thing she, before we got our, our station wagon, she said, don't tell your father we seen your other father today. And so we walked in the house, and the first thing I said was, Daddy, guess what? <laughs> I seen my other dad today. And so they sent me to the car, told me to lock the doors. I sat in the car in the summer by myself, the doors locked. And about an hour, my mom came out with a black eye, a bloody lip, crying, and just screaming to me, why? Why did you say something? Years later, and through other instances later of watching my mom go through domestic abuse and emotional abuse and physical abuse, I remember uh, her getting choked and spit on and assaulted in my house when I was about nine years old, 10 years old. And uh, she called the police, the police came. And I remember around Christmas time, my stepfather had bought me a Sega Genesis. And so the police came and they separated the two and then he put on this other personality of this good guy when the police came and told his side of the story. So the police were debating what happened as she's bleeding from her lip. And I remember taking my Sega Genesis out of the wall and throwing it down the steps, like, here, you can have that. And I remember going through other instances of watching you know, her abuse and verbal, physical, emotional. I remember him beating me to uh, I would bleed and have multiple whelps where they called Child Protective Services at school because they seen the whelps on me. Not the normal beating whelps, like overkill. And I remember him whooping with a, a belt my older cousin who lived with us, we adopted, so viciously as I sat inside the room, I remember I was crying because he just beat him so long. It was just excessive. So, what I identified identified who has driven me is to be able to protect my mother and protect my family. That's why it wasn't a glorified drug dealer story why I started selling drugs at 15. That's not why I left home at 15, living from house to house. That's not why I dropped out of high school at 16. It wasn't to be cool. It wasn't to be some dope boy image. It was because I was trying to figure out, I was trying to break free and figure out what I can do within my capacity to save and take care of and protect my family. Watching my mom struggle on food stamps, on welfare, getting Goodwill clothes for Christmas, these are my, my real life experiences. While going through practical turmoil. And so, I'm t the reason why I'm bringing this up now, outside of just being on my heart in general, is that initially I thought that that corner and other 
illegal activities or whatever I could come up with was my way out and how I was going to provide and protect my family. And I remember being 17 years old and when people would talk about going to jail or going to prison, it never scared me. I was always okay with the fact, I said, well, if I have to go to jail, but my mom is, I have to go to jail for life. My mom and my sisters, my brother and the oldest of four, if they're straight, I had already committed to the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So, and there's another part to this, but for you guys understanding who I am and why I do what I do and why we do what we do, These J. Morris Academy, Tulsa Fund, these, these aren't just companies and institutions. These are safe havens. These are solutions and vehicles to be able to arm us and equip us with the economic resources we need to not be boxed in and be in such detrimental social economic situations. I remember being 19 years old. My daughter was born while I was in prison, my daughter Anna. And I remember fighting with her mother the same kind of way that I saw my mom fought against. I remember turning into the man that I hated. And luckily, I caught myself in my mid-20s and I was able to get rooted and, and spiritually grounded and understand that and, and, and change and evolve. But I grew up so angry. That's why when I talk about the stories that we often laugh about, so to follow us, when I say, at 20 years old, I was on parole in New York for the charge I served a year prison sentence for. But then I also was in bail in New Jersey for an open charge. But then I was on bail on another charge in Maryland. And I was still selling drugs. It wasn't because I was just so gangster. Because I'd already committed to the struggle. I had already committed to the sacrifice. I was already willing to give up everything I had for the advancement of my family. And the same spirit, the same character in me is what applies today with my extended family. It's the same thing. It's just who I am. So after I get out the shower and I'm kind of going over these talking points in my head and wanting to share this with you all, I get a text message from my fiance, who most of you are familiar with, Ernestine Johnson, who we split ways today so she could go to Alabama, Saraland, Alabama, with my sister Tamika Mallory and my son and other activists to stand for justice and march for justice for Shakisha Clemens, who was assaulted. The, the video we saw in the Waffle House where the young queen was assaulted by the cop and her breasts were exposed and she was basically molested in the middle of the store. So there in Saraland, going to um, fight for her justice. So I get a text message, uh, well, actually prior to the text message, I get a call. She, said, you read, she asked me, did you read the text message? I said, no, I was in the shower. So she said, she would read it, call me back. So I sent her with some brothers that we are fellow activists with from the Nation of Islam, who um, I sent her with some security, or some brothers that agreed to watch her back while I can't be there. And the text message said basically that their leader, Minister Farrakhan, said that those people in Alabama are trained to kill you and they will. And if you guys continue to march, I can't back you. <coughs> and so the Nation of Islam brothers that she was with had to follow their leadership as they should. And so we had that call. So she said, babe, what do I do? But also, my sister Tamika's there, my son is there, our other comrades are there. And so, here I am with my fiance, two months from marriage.
have to make a decision on do I send my woman on the front line? Well, I'm here. And it's not that I'm sad. It's that I'm frustrated. And I'm angry. That there's no European or white Caucasian CEO executive has to make that decision. Here I am trying to create a learning opportunity for our community to advance, to launch an investment vehicle for us to be able to partner, invest together, to rebuild our community. And on top of all those intricacies, decisions, frustrations, vulnerability, I also have to decide or do I allow my woman who I'm here to protect to be vulnerable on the front line to defend other members of our community. Only we have to go through that. And so why that's relevant to what today's class is about is that we have to be so intentional and so focused about getting our financial resources in order. This country does not love us. Get it straight through your head. Say it. This country was not made for you, you brown or black person, you Latino, you of African descent. That is what it is. Stop fooling yourself. Stop going with the lie. We have to be intentional about building our own economic infrastructure so we can have our own defense infrastructure, to have our own educational infrastructure, to have our own social infrastructure, our own reserve funds. We have to do everything. We have to, we have to and hopefully I'm leading enough by example, we have to create all the institutions, the infrastructure organization we need to be self-sustained. Or they will wipe us off the face of this earth. You watch many videos, you can see a white woman curse a cop the hell out. Tell them all about, I watched a video last night of a white guy getting tased by two cops swinging on him. They just kept tasing and chasing out the door. That brother right there pulled out a cell phone. His queen might be calling us for a march or a rally. Because we haven't been intentional enough as a community about figuring out the micro, the macro solutions for how we fix what's going on and what's happening against us. Yesterday was Malcolm X's birthday. In the 1960s, Malcolm said we suffer from political oppression, economic exploitation, and social degradation. And here you go, what's this, 50 years, 60 years later? Same thing going on. Malcolm gave us the blueprint then. He said, we need to, if these so-called civil rights leaders are so brilliant to integrate us, why haven't they used that same genius to be able to build financial infrastructures for us to pull our own dollars and control our own? He said it back in 1965. And so today we're doing the work to implement those ideas and ideologies and that blueprint. So this work we do with these classes and what you're going to learn today, what you continue to learn from us, these are the lessons, these are the strategies that broke me free and helped break my family free. What allowed my mom now to be building a house in North Carolina? Outside of the first apartment we had, we spoke, swept roaches out of it 
of a one bedroom section eight crib. We got work to do. We gotta stop pretending like somebody's gonna come save us. We have to stop pretending that this government and its institutions are meant to somehow accidentally repair us. They don't want to see us with guns. They don't want to see us with money. They don't want to see our men in any kind of position of strength or leadership. Or as men who take care of their woman and their home, which is why they propagate so much misogynism in our culture. The more they can think that, get us to think that it's cool to have multiple women and be a rolling stone and not take care of your home. And the more they get our women to think that I don't need no man, the more we have a broken family, which in turn is a broken community, a broken village, a broken nation of people. This is intentionally designed to have us that way. And the only way to reverse it is we have to be just as, if not more, intentional. And so I just want you, I want to share that with you all. I didn't mean to be so heavy at the start of the class, um, but I must go with the flow of life and where my spirit, you know, takes me. But this is serious stuff, this financial battle that we got. This is, this is real. And the finances is only an economic base for all the other work that we got to do. It's not as simply as you getting a new Benz. Or you getting the house you want or the bag you want. Or just sending your child to school. It's way bigger than that. It's about how do we get enough economic astuteness, economic strategy base, knowledge base, and actual capital base. <clears throat> How do we get enough trust amongst each other to be able to collaborate and do business with one another? How do we look at each other in a way that we can relate to each other despite our differences, okay. despite our religions, despite our economic classes, our educational levels, despite our diaspora origins. That's our task at hand. But we have to understand, and our message and the information we teach is universal for all nationalities, ethnicities, and communities. But we are intentional about doing God's work and serving those least amongst us, which is our community. The least, the last place, those who have been the poorest for 450 years every year on year. And so I just want us to all understand that what we do as an organization, and I try to protect it as much as possible with who we bring in, which is why I'm always proud and happy to have my, my sister who's gonna be lecturing for you today present because I know her heart for our people and she's a fighter and she's brilliant and she's swaggy <laughs> <laughs> but it's just really important that y'all understand the mission of what we're doing here is deeper than just flipping a house it's deeper than just it's deeper than that if we don't have a strong economic base we have no ammunition, no fuel to fight what is an obvious fight. We just act like it's not obvious. I, I had to think about today, because the KKK, where they're protesting, the KKK is there in Alabama. In Saraland, where they're protesting. And I just found out that the police now have put signs around the protest area saying, no guns allowed within X amount of feet of this protest area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now our protesters are unarmed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. while the KKK are armed around them. And the most frustrating part 
and saddest part that I had to consider is that if something were to happen and they were to assault or even massacre, wipe out our people there on the ground, from based on history and evidence, all I could think that my people would do is go protest about it. Or tweet or hashtag about it. Man, all the people got killed out there. Dang. Well, I'm here to tell you something. Something happened down here to good people. If yeah, something happens in Sarah Lynn today, to anybody associated under my watch, there's going to be some serious consequences here in America. They ain't going to be no march. Mm -hmm. If we as men in this community are not willing to stand up for our community and our women, if we're not willing to die for our community and for our women, then we have failed our village. We are cowards. We are cowards on the watch. And I won't live life like that. I never have lived life like that. From the time I was 10 years old, talking junk to a grown man who just beat my mom. Or when I was 15 years old when that man choked me, and I choked him back. and said it's gonna stop today. That's it, that's right. I don't live like that. I'm not no punk, I'm not no coward. That's not the leader that I am or will be, or man that I am, that's the man my mom raised. So I just want you to understand what kind of leadership you have here. I know a lot about finances, about wealth creation, about wealth protection. I'm willing to always offer it to you all in a relatable way, as accessible as possible, as affordable as possible. But we have some serious work to do. So I want you guys to take your notes. You have a genius who will be instructing you, someone who is proven, tested, built well, built infrastructure, built organizations, knows her stuff, has went from poverty and welfare herself as a single teenage mom. We're going to give you the game and a blueprint for our boss queens, our women, the anchors in our family, the anchors of our village. If you all, I'm talking to my queens right now, all of you, if you all know how to build wealth, how to build credit, how to leverage credit, how to purchase properties, how to keep a household monthly budget, all the way up to syndicating deals and mitigating taxes and all these strategies. If you all know that, guess what? Huh. All our children gonna know it. Right. And then their children's children will know it. Because hopefully the man will be in the household and can contribute, but the man should be out there protecting and providing while you nurture and teach and educate and make sure that the household is sound financially. That's why this class is so critical. Our community will rise no higher than the level of our woman. So it's how we uplift you by calling you queens or sisters or goddess or whatever we can do to uplift you socially and elevate you. It's how we protect you and nurture you as well, holding doors for you, treating you with respect, defending you, but it's also how we can help pour into you from a financial and educational standpoint so that you have the tools and resources needed to hold the family down 
if the man is not around, hopefully that's not for reasons of intentionalism, intentionalness, but he's not around because he's been out fending, protecting, providing. We want to give you those resources. So without further ado, I would love for you to give a big round of applause for my sister who came all the way from New Haven, Connecticut. She's a wealth mastery instructor in JMA. She has her own organization and brand, Outreach Realty, Miss Millionaire Mindset. She has a national sisterhood, her own, her own sorority. She is a dynamic woman. Um, not just only a few of her stats and, and career, she can tell you more about that, but she is phenomenal, dynamic, a heart for our people. She loves our people, a great mom and wife. She wears all those hats and does them in high heels. <laughs> and she came all the way from Connecticut after speaking yesterday, I believe, in Boston. Yeah. Yeah. Came all the way down to spend time and speak with us and pour into you all. So I want you to give a, a warm round of applause for my sister. Miss Millionaire Mindset, Roberta Hosky. Now let's, hi honey. Let, I, you see the heart of this man right here? The, the heart, you cannot pay for this type of heart. And I, I just want to say I, I thank you for being who you are, Jay. It's not too many people who would be transparent like that and really pour his heart in what he does. And the message, today, this message that I got right here is probably scrapped right now. <laughs> but the message is, is that life is bigger than us. If you don't get nothing else from today, the life is bigger than us. We can't be so self-centered and egotistic to think it's about us. What you went through, what you're going through, what you're going through is about somebody else and how you can level up and help somebody else on a global level. But until we realize it, until we realize it, we will always be those crabs in the barrel, amounting to nothing, trying to figure stuff out, chasing our own tail. The answer to everything is already in you. It's already in you. It's how you visualize it. It's how you visualize it. Now we follow a whole bunch of mess, but who wouldn't follow this? Who wouldn't follow him? So when we leave here today, and he didn't even talk about the, he talked a little bit about the Tulsa Fund. Hopefully everybody already signed up. How many people signed up? And that's not enough. Everybody here needs to be raised. Because if you ain't part of the solution, you part of the problem, sorry. So if you, your hand ain't raised, you part of the problem. I don't care if you like me, it don't make a difference or who I am. But I'm gonna be raw and I'm gonna be real because it's bigger than me. You can never, no one's successful on an island. Somebody who's been successful all by themselves. It's impossible, there's power in unity. That's why we're constantly fought with our unity. And women, that's why we always talking about each other. Hating, I don't like what she got on, I don't like her heels, all that nonsense. When we're supposed to build together. The Tulsa Fund, how many people got it, already registered already? Now how many people gonna register? Now everybody together, that's part of it. <laughs> Listen, I admire you and I love you. I love you, Mr. Jesus, I love you.